Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome back to the lecture series in bioelectricity. So, we are into lecture number 27. In the previous lecture, we talked about, uh, we summarized all the different sense organs like uh, vision, hearing, taste, olfaction, and touch, pressure sensors, all these things. So, at the higher centers of the brain, all these informations are coded electrical signals are being coded at different regions. And we remember all these informations, they get consolidated over a period of time. And this consolidation of these informations, which we recollect whenever we need it is called memory, which is one of the central problem in science, how biological systems remember things. Whenever we think about memory, we think about you know in electronics, we talk about binary codes 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1 likewise. Okay. And these binary codes code the informations on CD disk or in uh, mobile drives and so many other information storage uh, systems. But how does biology do so? how these electrical impulses remain embedded within our system, in what form, how they are retained throughout their life, how we recollect things, what happens when we sleep, why it is being said that suppose you have an exam tomorrow morning, so you should sleep tonight, you should not do a night out, because then your mind will go blank. Most of these questions are the questions of the or the questions which will take us to the next frontier. These are pretty much the final frontier, who are we and what is that thing which ensures our very core of our existence. Because this question even becomes more profoundly challenging, when we see an Alzheimer's disease patient, a patient who loses his own identity, they forget who they are, they forget the whole surrounding, because there are certain group of neurons within the brain, which starts to die, for totally unknown reason. Of course, it is known that they form certain aggregated uh, moieties a, beta and bunch of it, but why it is triggered is not known. Similarly, there are patients of Parkinson, they lose all their motor functions. There are specific areas within the brain, which starts to die out. Yet, there are patients in whose situation, the motor neuron in the spinal cord started to die out they suffer from amyotropic lateral sclerosis. So, all of them have one common feature, wherever these neurons are dying out, the assigned functionality of the neurons of that area is lost. And if it is lost in the hippocampal region and the surrounding cortical region, is termed as Alzheimer's disease, where the person completely suffer from a permanent dementia, they forget everything and in and around and they die without really knowing who they are. It is very sad, but that is the harsh reality of life, that who are we is also fairly we do not know. So, this subject for centuries have inspired the psychologist, scientist 
and in the modern world the neuroscientists, people who work on consciousness, memory, so on and so forth. Today we will uh, just study a kind of little scratch on the iceberg, because there is a huge amount of literature on all these things. They are uh, pretty much subject in themselves, but what we will be doing we will be talking about the anatomical features of the brain and uh, the electrical signals which are believed to code for memory acquisition and memory storage uh, machine a very little of it. And of course, we will be talking a little bit about sleep and uh, different rhythms of the brain and the tools used to understand most of the brain waves electroencephalogram and the different kind of waves which are found in the brain. So, before we embark into this uh, brief journey into the very deep recess of our brain, which distinguishes who we are. We need to assimilate all the sensory informations, what we have gathered by assigning the part of the brains, where they are getting stored. Okay. So, first thing we will do, I will draw the brain uh, overall anatomy of the brain, and we will locate the different spots in the cortex or in the cortical region, where the different informations are being stored. So, to start off with, so this is lecture 22, so here we will be talking about memory learning. electroencephalogram. I am, I may not follow the same sequence, but I am just kind of you know enumerating Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson disease and of course, we will be talking about the brain anatomy, very, very briefly though, brain anatomy and different cortical regions, one memory and the different models of memory, the existing models. learning, sleep, which are brain waves sorry, brain waves and EEG, which is also called electro encephalogram. We will be talking about sleep, talking about Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, little bit of we will be talking about ALS or amyotropic lateral sclerosis and some of the prosthesis. To start off with, so we may need to you know move on to the next class to cover some of these topics, but to start off with let us talk about the different uh, regions of the brain, which store different kind of information. So, in the next slide, let me draw the overall architecture of the brain. So, if you look from the top, the brain pretty much looks like this. So, there are two halves of the brain and they are connected by a tissue, which is called corpus callosum. Corpus callosum. Okay. Then, 
you have here the prefrontal cortex prefrontal cortex and then you have speech area then you have writing area then you have auditory cortex of right ear auditory cortex of right ear then you have some area out here which is called general interpretive center or mostly language and mathematical calculations and out here you have the visual cortex for a right eye okay now on the other side if you look at it you have the sense of touch then of course you have the auditory cortex the counterpart on this ac then you have spatial visualization and analysis which is sitting somewhere here people there are certain people who could you know imagine three dimensional structure far better than other spatial visualization and analysis and likewise in the fourth so this is the right hemisphere and and this is the left hemisphere and it has been observed that uh, this is the right hand and the, as is, I have already mentioned the right eye the information is processed on this side and the left eye the information is processed on the opposite side so this is the left hand likewise okay so if you look at it what is very interesting to note is these different areas so this is you are seeing from the top so if you look underneath if i just go a little bit more on the anatomy and if i have a side view of the brain it will be something like this out here you have an organ called pituitary which is the neuroendocrine organ and here you have the spinal cord see and out here deep inside there is an organ called hippocampus the seat for memory the name it got the name because this organ is in Greek it is called seahorse. Okay. And since it almost looks like if you kind of you know get a get a three dimensional view, it almost looks like looks like a seahorse, and that is why it got a name you see a seahorse. The first question is how it was discovered that it is this organ which is the seat of memory. So, all this is started somewhere middle of uh, last century around 1930s and 40s. Before that this whole area of memory acquisition and memory was fairly dominated by the psychologist. The modern neuroscience has its beginning from the time of Ramon Y. Cajal in the very early 19th century 1901-1910. Cajal made his seminal contribution where he they did silver staining with Golgi you know silver staining and all those things and the whole anatomy was fairly clear 
and it was at the same time when Sherrington and all of the people slowly electrical responses for the neurons were being started, people I started recording all these things. So, that was the kind of beginning of uh, what you see today's modern bioelectrical phenomena of the nervous system, somewhere around that time. So, 1940s there was a very unusual event, so and simultaneously there was another group of thinkers who were uh, developing learning models. So, one of the learning model which was developed during that time was developed by a guy called Donald E. Hebb, which is also popularly called Hebbian and this is he was a psychologist, Hebbian learning model. A very interesting model, this is among the very in the present context of the most primitive or the most or the first one, first of the learning models, which essentially say it very interesting thing. It says say for example, there is a signal generated by A and there is a receiver of signal B. A is the sender of signal and B is receiving the signal and both of them are active at the same point of time and then and this information is getting. So, I am just putting info, info, info is transmitted from A to B. B. It may happen after a point, even when A stops sending signal to B. In other words, there is no more signal going from A. B will still keep on receiving signal from A. It sounds to you a very paradoxical situation, because A is not sending, sending any signal after a point, but B is still active. It is as if it is still receiving signal and it is being said it is that at this stage, this is the stage of B when it store information. But this model of learning and this is where the permanent changes takes place in the network and the network properties lead to the acquisition of information at this stage. But this Hebbian learning or Donald E. Hebb's learning model was not proved in biology till 1970s or halfway through 1960s, but in between something else happened. So, if we talk about the genesis of Hebb's model, it was around say you know 19 I would say 1930s and 1940s this learning model was proposed. It is a theoretical model. Okay. 1940s, late 40s accounted for a very interesting piece of uh, event, which took place in one of the hospitals in Canada. What happened exactly? There was a mine worker. This mine worker had a pathological problem. He was he was he was suffering from chronic uh, epilepsy. So very frequently he had to you know he used to get this epileptic bouts. So what essentially happens in epilepsy is something like this. Say for example, if this is your brain, and uh, this is the spinal cord, and you know these are the different organs, and like you know eyes, ear, and likewise. So the epilepsy bout all of a sudden this whole brain, this whole thing becomes hyper excitable, hyper excited. This is once again epilepsy and when you become hyper excited, so there is pretty much collision of informations and this person lose pretty much coordination with rest of its system. Like all this peripheral system and this system, they kind of disalign from each other. There is hardly any control left and this person faints. 
And these kind of epileptic bouts could be very dangerous, suppose you are driving or something like you know you lose complete contact with your peripheral system. So, this mine worker was suffering from chronic epilepsy problem and uh, every now and then he had to take leave and he had to go through the medication and everything. And on one occasions uh, the neurosurgeons did something very interesting. What they did it was they could figure out the zone of the brain for where, from where this you know hyper excitability is originated and it was observed that within the brain again I am just going by the side view of the brain. If you look at the brain like this and if this is a side view, this is the spinal cord, medulla oblongata. And these are the different cortical regions what I have showed in the first slide. So, out here I was highlighting about the area of hippocampus, okay. Hippocampus. So, what the doctors did was they surgically removed this part. When they removed this hippocampus from the brain of this mine worker, this individual got rid of his epilepsy though, did not suffer from epilepsy, but from that day he never acquired any further memory. So, he lived like you know whatsoever was stored, he never from that day he never remembered anything. Is not that very strange, but that is what it is, that is what happened, they remove it. So, the result, so you are removing it, I am just showing a minus sign, no further memory acquisition. So, this person lived all on his previous pieces of information never learned anything after that, never learned anything. This experiment or this is a real life situation, you can even call it an experiment or this uh, surgery by the doctors during 19 between 1940s and 1950s, open up the question of learning and memory again in a much more bigger way, because now the doctors realize or the neuroscientists realize the major organ or one of the if not the major, but one of the rate limiting organ in memory acquisition or memory storage or information processing apart from the cortical regions is hippocampus. So, if you look at the historically, this was an absolute accident, because doctors wanted to help this patient and you know they just uh, removed that part of the brain, which they were suspecting that is from where most of the epileptic bouts were originating. And uh, result definitely minus epilepsy, but minus 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 no further memory acquisition but now the question arises is this area could also show what has been proposed by donald hebb fairly on the same time does this area showed any form of heavian learning model and if so, how is it? So, next thing came, so I am just highlighting those wonderful work, which had been done by a bunch of people during the last century, which set the tone for our modern day research in understanding uh, the memory acquisition phenomena. And 
the next thing came was done by three gentlemen Bliss, Lomo and Colin Gritch. Bliss, TVP Bliss, Lomo and Colin Gritch. And the venue this time was Europe. So, this happened in Canada and now back in England. What was being done is that in a guinea pig they remove the one second let me draw it, they remove the hippocampal region. So, now you have a wonderful hippocampal tissue out there and in that hippocampal tissue they implanted electrodes like this. I am just putting the electrodes now and by the way this hippocampal structure is very well organized. It has different regions which are named as C A 1, C A 2, C A 3 and underneath there is a region called dented gyrus. So, the implanted electrodes out there multiple electrodes and they implanted electrode in another anatomically another distinct region of the brain within the hippocampus. So, let us name these electrodes as region A and region B ok. Then what they did? They started giving stimulus from here. high train stimulus going. So, automatically through this pathway, so this is a connecting pathway, the signal will be reaching here. So, on these electrodes you could now receive the signal. So, they are receiving signal. Okay. Now, say for example, up to time say T 1 to say T 15, I am just taking arbitrary numbers, time 1 to time 15 they kept on giving a stimulus and automatically as they were giving a stimulus, electrode B was receiving the signal. And what they did at T 16 on, they stopped giving signal and what they observed was B is continuously receiving signal in spite of the fact T 16 on for a while for a fairly good amount of time in spite of the fact there is no more signal coming from T from the A region. This was a stunning discovery. So, it means now if you go back to the Hebbian learning model A is sending signal B is receiving signal but after a point A stopped giving signal, stop, no more signal, a still B is receiving signal. For the first time, this was a wonderful journal of physiology paper, for the first time Habian learning model was proved. that indeed there are regions in the brain which follows a different set of computation. And this process of memory acquisition was termed as long term potentiation which is one of the most accepted models of memory acquisition, which in short is also called LTP. Now, the question arises, sure this electrical phenomena does exist, 
but does this phenomena exist in the intact brain or not, because this is a slice of tissue which you have taken out. This answer in last 50 years we have not been able to answer this, still we have a long way to go, but this question has just opened up the whole field of neuronal computation, electrical signal processing that what exactly is happening. So, now the first question which comes in mind is that between A and B, is it if I consider these as presynaptic and the one which are sending signal and these are post synaptic neurons, then is this a presynaptic phenomena or is it a post synaptic phenomena. And if it is whatsoever the phenomena is, are there retrograde transport available, are there messengers which are sent even after the signal is over, are there signals which are being sent to A telling that you keep on sending more and more signal, in spite of the fact the external signals have all stopped, there is no more external signal being given, if these are considered as external signals. Okay. Then, if is it, it is so, which is suspected it is so, then what are those retrograde messengers, who are those retrograde messengers? There are indication towards very simple molecules like you know nitric oxide, NO, arachidonic acid, glycine likewise, but again none of them have been proved beyond doubt that yes these are the retrograde messengers. Still there is a lot of controversy over the fact that is it a pre synaptic event or is it a post synaptic event. What we know for sure is this phenomena indeed happen, heavy and learning model indeed work. But this happens when there is a very strong train of signal sent by A, strong train of signals. Okay. Now, the question arises, what are the permanent changes which are taking place in the postsynaptic membrane. Permanent changes in post synaptic membrane. These are the questions which people are trying to address, but there is another thing which comes in mind. So, this is a situation when say for example, you are trying to remember a new poem or a new piece of information, you are intense on it, okay. 2 on the 2, 2 to the 4, 2 to the 6 or something like that. But say for example, you just observe something for a fraction of a moment or you see a snake or you see a blast, you still remember it. So, in this situation the signal is not very in, like you know not a huge train coming for a while, it is one spot moment is does this follow as follows a long term potentiation model or say for example, you do bicycling, you are biking, you are walking, how these are coordinated, you never do a memory recall that all these processes, there must be other coding information and that takes us to the next uh, set of information coding, which falls under another model, which is called long term depression model. We will come to that, but before I come to the long term depression model, what essentially is happening. So, when if we believe, so now the way it uh, the current theory says is, if I am giving a side view of the brain now, out here, if this is the area which is involved in the hippocampal region. So, it is believed what is happening is this, first of all the sensory inputs are reaching here, 
through the spinal cord, the OLO are showing the sensory inputs. Okay. All these different sensory inputs. These sensory inputs are initially stored just like a buffer memory out here. Just what you see in a computer as the RAM, random access memory, buffer memory or you can call it random access memory, RAM chip. Okay. The bigger the RAM you have, the better off you are. Then from here, there is a consolidation phenomena takes place, where basically the information are sorted out. If you remember, when I was telling you that if you go back to the first slide, or second sorry, yeah, this slide. So, there are different region, the speech component, there is a writing component, there is an auditory component there is a spatial visualization component, there is a touch component, there is a visual component, visual cortex out here. Likewise, now coming back to this, it is exactly the same thing. Now, each one of these different components are going to their different regions. Say for example, we observe something, we observe and say you know an apple. So, it has see look at the component, it has a color, it has a taste, it has a texture, it has a shape, um, maybe it has some emotional value with your something, you know. So, all these informations, so for, for our nervous system, these are electrical signal. These different electrical signals are stored at say color region, taste region, texture region, shape region likewise. So, the same thing is coded at different places and whenever we have to recollect, this all has to be further integrated to realize that this is an apple. So, essentially what is happening is your hippocampus is acting as the zone of buffer memory and from the hippocampus slowly and gradually the informations are being transmitted to the different areas of the brain, where they are permanently stored. So, when this zone, this area started to die off, we do not acquire any further memory and many a times we lose our own identity what exactly happens in the hippocampal region. Of course, we will come in depth about the cellular architecture of this and the information. So, before I even go to the long term depression and all other models, this is very interesting to understand that you know how this area actually. So, the, as of now, this is the most accepted model of memory acquisition that something happens or some the memory is acquired in the hippocampal region and it is being slowly you know transmitted back to the different regions of the brain where different pieces of information are getting stored in the bits and pieces. Okay. So, what essentially happens in Alzheimer's? I am, I am not entering into the long term depression at this stage, I will be getting there very soon. So, what happens in the Alzheimer's? Now, first of all we have to look into this structure. So, let us investigate this structure. This structure is, I told you, is a structure like this. So, this structure is a multi-layer structure. It is a very three-dimensional structure. This is not something the way I am, I am drawing it. it is much more complex structure like this. Okay. So, now here, the neurons are at different level neurons are kind of you know the layers of neurons which are present out here and most of these neurons have a very characteristic uh, shape their cell body is more like a pyramid and these are called pyramidal neurons pyramidal neurons and 
during Alzheimer's, what happens is that out here there is an accumulation of, there is an aggregation of certain specific proteins which are called A beta proteins, and which the current, if the current theory has to be believed, leads to a blockage in the electron ionic electricity transport pathway. And eventually what happened, their cell bodies, their processes started to die out, what I am showing now, the process started to die out, and these cells fail to communicate with the rest of the system, because their processes are now being chopped off by this A beta peptide, which is getting accumulated and the electrical signal does not pass through. And eventually, this whole part of the brain, if you go back and see the side view of the brain, this whole part is kind of you know gone. All the pyramidal neurons dies out here. And that is what leads to an Alzheimer patient to lose his own identity. Same way, there are regions within the brain, like if I go back here, out here, there are within the cortex, there are motor cortex, areas of the brain where there are motor activities which are involved, the areas of motor cortex. Within the motor cortex, there are very specific areas are called substantia nigra. Let me just uh, highlight it in the motor cortex. There is this area called substantia nigra. These this area there are motor neurons which secretes dopamine and this is dopamine secreting motor neuron. And it is this area which coordinate motion. Now, for some absolutely unknown re reason, this substantia Niagara motor neurons started to die out. And what happens, this motion coordination is all lost. And this is the disease which is called Parkinson disease. So, if you look at, if you compare the previous slide, where we talk about Alzheimer's disease, and now, in the next, this slide, if you are comparing it with the Parkinson disease, both of them are neurodegenerative disorders, where the neurons are getting degenerated, but there is a fundamental difference between the two. The fundamental difference is that, in the case of Parkinson disease, you are losing your motor coordination, and in the case of Alzheimer's, you are losing your very basic who you are you cannot acquire any further memory, but a Parkinson patient does not suffer from dementia. So, though this process of neuron death is fairly similar, in this case alpha synuclein, there is a protein which is getting aggregated out there in uh, Parkinson. So, they all, if, I, if one has to give, they all fall under a protein aggregation problem. Some way or other, their machinery through which the electrical impulses are being transmitted are getting choked up or blocked or as if there is a traffic jam out there. So, if you really look at these neurons, the way they, they are, they are like you know, if I had to show you in three dimensional picture. So, there will be something like this, what, what you kind of in experiences. These are the process, all over the neurons, you know, this is cell body. So, what you see, there is a lot of aggregation of proteins out, out here. And because of this aggregation, the electrical impulses, which are originated out here, fails to travel through this, and eventually they die out. So, this is the protein and peptide aggregation. So, both Alzheimer's and Parkinson and even amyotropic lateral sclerosis are fairly similar problem. There is a neurodegeneration, but 
there are different proteins involved and it is very interesting that one area does not influence as the other area as of now with their own knowledge, but end of the day that destroying that part. So, now if you see this image what I was trying to show any of these area if any of these area kind of you know is affected by any specific disease then we will be losing that modality or say for example, if there is a problem with visual cortex we lose vision, if there is an auditory cortex problem we lose the auditory ability, if there is a problem in the writing cortex we lose the writing ability, if there is a problem in the touch cortex, touch cortical region involved in touch we will lose the sensation of touch, if this region is kind of getting affected the spatial and visualization analysis then we will be will not be able to coordinate and if there is a damage in the corpus callosum then the connectivity and crosstalk between the left and the right side of the brain will be hampered. So, this is what I wanted to highlight in terms of the long term potentiation and the memory acquisition process. So, what we will be do I will close this class here in the next class we will be talking about the long term depression and we will talk about all the brain waves which are involved in it and a little bit about the sleep. Okay. And then we will talk about some of the neuronal computation and neurotransmitters. Thanks a lot.